Little Britches, Father and I Were Ranchers. Chapter 6 We Become Real Ranchers. It rained most of the next couple of weeks. One of Fred's hired men had found our horses and what was left of the wagon and buckboard. Nig was all right, but Bill stood with his back humped up most of the time, and all the starch seemed to have drained out of Nancy's legs. We kept them in the end of the bunkhouse Father had cut off to use for a kitchen while he and I worked on the other end. There was no school when it rained, so I could stay home and help him a lot. We built a new wagon body and put some new spokes in the wheels of the buckboard right there in the bunkhouse. Between showers, we built a new privy. We were never able to find even one board of our old one. I had to bring two pails of milk from Altland's every night. When I had eggs to bring too, Grace went with me to lug the basket. Mother was making father drink all of one bucket of milk every day and giving him raw eggs with a spoonful of brandy in the glass. I still like the smell of that brandy, but the weather was getting warm enough so that I couldn't get blue anymore. Father's cough got better day by day, but as he grew stronger, Nancy grew weaker. One morning near the end of the second week, Father went out to the bunkhouse and found her dead. Grace and I had to go to school that day, so we missed the funeral. Our big win must have been an ill one, because I never heard of anyone it did any good, except maybe it did help us a little in one way. That Saturday, after Nancy died, Father and I were putting the buckboard back together when a man with a big load of new boards stopped out in front of our house. He came in and said his name was Wright and that he lived a couple of miles up the creek. He said the wind had raised the dickens with his buildings, and he'd noticed how nicely we were getting fixed up again. After he'd watched Father work for a little while, he said, You seem to be a pretty handy sort of fellow with a hammer and saw. I wish I could get you to come and help me get fixed up. I'd give you $3 a day for your time, or trade work with you, or trade something I might have that you wanted. Father told Mr. Wright he ought to be getting started with his own plowing now and that the rains had come, but he would talk it over with Mother and let him know the next day. Mother must have said it was all right because Father helped Mr. Wright for a couple of weeks. Father drove Bill and Nig up to Mr. Wright's the first morning. When he came home, he had a saddled bay mare tied to the tail of the wagon and a little black and white collie puppy in the pocket of his reefer coat. He said Mr. Wright had insisted on lending him the mare to ride back and forth, but the puppy was ours to keep. It was still so young, it was wobbly on its legs and cute as could be. We all wanted to claim it, but Father wouldn't let us. He said Muriel could name it, but it would belong to all of us. She named it King. I like King a lot, but it was the saddle horse that really took my eye. She was a crabby Morgan mare and laid her ears back every time anyone went near her. In the mornings when Father put the saddle on, she would fling her head around and snap at him with her teeth, but she always missed him by an inch or two. She could run like a greyhound and I wanted to ride her so much I couldn't think about anything else, but neither Father nor Mother would let me go within a rod of her. I had got so I could ride Willie Aldevolte's donkey without my feet being tied together and only holding on to the belly strap with one hand. Willie had taught me how to squeeze my knees tight behind the withers and ride on them instead of the seat of my pants. I had spent hours practicing and knew that, especially with a saddle, I could ride the mare as easy as pie. It was about the middle of April when Father finished helping Mr. Wright repair his buildings. He took Bill and Nig with him the last Friday. I remember so well because that was the day we changed from being immigrants to being ranchers. When he came home that night, the bay mare was tied to the tailgate. She didn't have the saddle on, but there was a driving harness in the wagon, along with four little Berkshire pigs and two gunny sacks with the heads of half a dozen hens sticking out of holes in each of them. I wanted to claim and name the new mare, but father wouldn't let me. He said we had all except Philip named something so he must have his choice. He chose Fanny. Mother didn't want the end of the bunkhouse as a kitchen after the horses had been living in it, so Saturday morning we hooked Bill and Nig to it 
and hauled it out where the first barn had stood. It had been built with board walls inside and out, and the space between them stuffed with straw. We worked to beat the band all day. After we got it moved, Father ripped up the floor and pulled off all the inside boards. He let Grace and me pull the old nails and pound them out straight. While Muriel and Philip were lugging the straw to the hen coop and pig pen, he built with the floorboards. When Father hauled the piece of the barn away, it left the bunkhouse with one end open. That Sunday, he built a new end into it with boards he had pulled off the inside of the barn and made a partition in the middle so there was a room for Philip and me and one for Grace and Muriel. While he was doing it, Grace and I helped Mother move the beds and make us bureaus out of boxes the groceries had come in. She put cloth around them with ruffles, and we made scallop paper coverings for them and cut doilies from pieces of old wallpaper. By supper time, everything was done, and Grace and I were so excited about sleeping in a real bunkhouse that we could hardly get away from the table quickly enough. Father had promised Mother that he would plow a garden out behind the barn before he did anything else. He started it early Monday morning, but he hadn't got around the plot once before we had to go to school. He'd made a triple tree for the plow and balanced it carefully so to adjust the amount of pull to the strength of each horse. Nig was to walk in the furrow and pull the biggest share, Bill in the middle with the next biggest, and Fanny on the outside with only a little more than half as much load as Nig. But Fanny had no intention of being a plow horse. She was all right while Father was putting Nancy's collar on and the hames with the chain traces on her. But when he tried to rein her up beside the other horses, she squealed and tried to bite chunks out of Bill's neck. Father fixed that quick enough by fastening a stick about three feet long between her bridle and Bill's collar. But when he hooked her traces, she kicked and jumped around till she had both hind legs over them and was faced the wrong way. Father unhooked her and talked easy till he had her back where she belonged. But every time he got the traces hooked to the triple tree, she would do the same thing all over again. If it had been Mother, I think she would have killed Fanny right then and there. But Father didn't seem to get mad at all. Only the muscles in his jaws went in and out. At last, he made another jockey stick and put her in the middle with one stick fastened to Bill's collar and the other to Nig's. That way, she couldn't swing out around, but she did kick like fury and got both legs over the traces. Bill and Nig didn't get any more excited than Father did, while Fanny slatted and threw herself around. She acted just like a little kid in a tantrum. And we'll pause here for now and finish up this chapter next time. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks so much for watching. Love you guys. Bye-bye.